if no one has asked for help, but you are still wondering if help is needed or potentially the person isn't in a position or in a place where they are able to ask for help, then you can ask if help is wanted. I would really like to create and coin the phrase of help consent, which I feel like is something that would be so great for us to practice as a society. Welcome to Chez Jeunesse, the place of new beginnings. My name is Katherine Hubert, and I founded and own a French-inspired cafe where, as a team, we are on a mission to change the way that our world understands neurodiversity and employs humans with disabilities. Our restaurant was born and is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where we practice and teach our mission and model. This is our channel where we dive in deep to who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Our hope is that this content is empowering to disabled and non-disabled humans alike, and that no matter what perspective you are coming from, employer, employee, parent, friend, or Shazeness fan, you feel welcomed, you learn something new, and you walk away with a deeper appreciation and understanding of humanity. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm excited to be back with you this week. I took a week off last week. Thank you for your patience with that. Things got a little bit busier around the restaurant than I was anticipating and I was in the kitchen more than I normally am and I lost my time to film. So it's great to be back today. If you don't know me or you don't know me very well, I'm not a doctor. So this video is not coming from that of a medical professional. My experience is that of a restaurant owner, owning a restaurant that employs people with disabilities. I'm a disability integration coach, I'm a chef. So everything that I have to say today is gonna be based out of experience that I have with my team and not something that's coming from a medical background. So I wanted to preface that if you are interested in a more medically based video or scientifically based video about traumatic brain injuries, then this one is a really good one that I watched this week. And this is also a really good one that I would love to recommend. So given the fact that I am not a doctor, <laughs> uh, why am I making this video? Well, the very simple answer is that one of my teammates, Richmond, experienced a traumatic brain injury several years before coming to work at Chez Jeunesse. He's been here now for four or five years and has been a big part of our team. Also very faithfully watches our YouTube content every week and asks me if I would please make a video about traumatic brain injuries. So that's the simple answer as to why I'm doing this video. I've spent really the past month thinking about what I wanted it to be centered around and then also having conversations with Richmond. So you'll hear some of what he has shared with me in this video and you will also hear some of my perspective. The long and the short of it is that I've learned a lot over the past several years, not just about how traumatic brain injuries may show up or present in a person and how that may impact a work environment, but it's also just brought in my scope and understanding of disability and what accommodations and understanding look like also within a work context. So why is it important to talk about this? It's important because honestly, a lot of non-disabled humans automatically jump to the conclusion or assume that disabled humans need their help. And I would encourage us as non-disabled humans to view it the same way that we would view help for ourselves. Sometimes we want it, sometimes we need it, sometimes we don't. So not to make a biased or a blanketed judgment on someone with a disability and assume that they automatically want or need our help or that we are the best person to step in and provide that assistance. The link or the thread between this topic and these policies and my conversations with Richmond and his experience with traumatic brain injury are that in my conversation with him, that theme came up regularly. The questions that he gets asked, the help that he gets offered that's not always helpful, the frustrations and the ways that that has caused, the actual like has actually caused roadblocks or barriers for him in his own journey and process, that was a consistent theme that came up. And so that was something that I felt like I could talk about from the perspective of an employer and what it looks like to support and when not to for my team, Richmond and other teammates included in that. And then just as a general rule of thumb to the overall public, what are some things that we can keep in mind? Mind when trying to assess whether or not help is needed. Some good things to remember. Number one, was help asked for? Like I just said, not everyone needs help. <laughs> Sometimes our perception of what is happening is not actually what's happening. And so keeping that in mind, if someone wants help, 
trusting that they are independent, that they are responsible for their own wants and needs and that they can ask for it if that's something that is needed. I want to remind us of the Assume That I Can campaign that came out earlier this year. We have a video on that, but we're gonna show the reel again here because it so profoundly states this baseline that we oftentimes have culturally is that we assume someone without a disability is capable and we assume that someone with a disability is not. Hey bartender, you assume that I cannot drink a margarita. So you don't serve me a margarita? So I don't drink a margarita. Your assumption becomes reality. And parents, you assume that I cannot live on my own. So you don't encourage me to live on my own. So I don't live on my own. Coach, you assume that I cannot hit harder. So you don't train me to hit harder. So I don't hit harder. And teacher, you assume that I cannot learn Shakespeare. So, you don't teach me Shakespeare. Old MacDonald had a farm. So, I don't learn Shakespeare. E-I-E-I-O. But hey, if all your assumptions become reality, then assume that I can drink a margarita. Will you serve me a margarita? So I drink a margarita. Assume that I can live on my own. So I live on my own. Assume that I can hit harder. So I hit harder. Assume that I can learn well, Shakespeare. So, what fool would these mortals be? I learned fucking Shakespeare. You assume I can't swear, right? Assume that I can do that job. Then I can go to parties. Then I can have sex. Then I can be on stage. Assume that I can. So maybe I will. Asian-ass teammates, your keyword this week is panzanella. So if no one has asked for help, but you are still wondering if help is needed or potentially the person isn't in a position or in a place where they are able to ask for help, then you can ask if help is wanted. I would really like to create and coin the phrase of help consent, which I feel like is something that would be so great for us to practice as a society. I'm a fan of consent in all areas of life, help included. Has permission been given or has it been asked for in terms of help being given or wanted? This is something, there may be some extreme options or scenarios in life where this would not be the case. I'm thinking of emergency situations. For example, we've had someone have a seizure when they're in the restaurant before or someone who has lost consciousness. Those are examples where I'm not able to ask if they would like help, but it's obvious that help is needed and medical and emergency help at that are still in those moments, even if the person is not responsive, take the time and the effort to say, I'm calling 911, I'm going to place my hand on your head, like I'm going to move you, all of that. And part of that is to help keep myself calm and present and grounded in the moment. And part of that is to be respectful of the person that I'm caring for and any other people that may be there with them so that they know what's happening as well, but to just show that honor and that respect that you're a person, I'm assisting you, especially if I need to touch someone and they're not in a position where they can give me consent, still giving that verbal prompt before just jumping in. For the most part though, the person's going to be in a position where either they can ask for help or they can respond if you ask if they would like help. So why is that so important, especially when we're talking about traumatic brain injuries? The assumed help for a need that hasn't been stated may end up doing more harm than good. For example, Richmond walked me through how in his experience, especially in the couple of years directly following his injury, it was really important for him in his own recovery process to do things repetitively and to do them himself so that his brain could relearn what those steps and those processes were. Someone coming in and doing something for him takes away from that process of self-discovery. It also takes away from that process of relearning and being able to increase capacity increase speed, increase understanding and awareness. While someone might see this task or this movement or this motion may seem to be difficult for this person, and it may be, but it may be that they actually, it's still best for them to walk it out or to carry it out than it is for someone to step in and to do it for them. 
In that, also want to acknowledge that within the realm of disability and neurodiversity, there are a lot of different ways that something can be done. And so when you see someone doing something that's outside of your frame of reference for how it should be done, it doesn't necessarily mean that they need help or that they're doing it incorrectly. It may just mean that they have a different process or standard for themselves about the best way to accomplish it. Another example and another factor of traumatic brain injuries in particular is that balance and mobility can be factors and someone jumping in to help without knowing exactly what help is needed or how to provide it can actually cause a more unsafe environment for someone instead of a safer environment. So that's where, especially when physical elements are involved, it's really important to have an awareness and understanding and context of what is going on and ask the person directly, one, if they want help, and then two, if they do what help they want or need so that the help you are offering and that's being received is what's truly beneficial for the person. And lastly, it's important to ask for consent because not doing so can be really dehumanizing to someone. Just assuming that someone needs help and that you're the person to do it can take away from their own experience or their own sense of intelligence or capability. And so it's important to usually one, I try to, to give a beat <laughs> and observe. This is something that I've practiced a lot with my staff when I see my team accomplishing something and I catch myself in a moment of questioning whether or not they're going to see it all the way through or whether or not they can before I just jump in and ask if assistance is needed. Just waiting and being available, but not hovering <laughs> or taking a minute to just step back and observe. And then if there seems like there's an opportunity to say, would you like some support with that? Or can I give you a hand? I will. But a lot of times, the majority of the times, I end up being the one who's humbled <laughs> and who's surprised and realized they didn't need my help at all, that they had a plan and they were able to execute it. And again, it just looked different from the way that I might've executed it. And so giving that time and that space and not just assuming that it can't be done has been something that's been a great mental check for me and also has increased the confidence of my teammates in recognizing how good they are at their jobs <laughs> and how little help they actually need. Because I think, again, oftentimes, if someone with a disability has spent a lot of time in their life with people just automatically assuming or doing things for them, and that's breaking down that confidence or that sense of morale or fulfillment, then being in a place where you get to build that up can be really important. One last thing to tag on there, and then we are gonna wrap it up for today. The amount of time that it takes to accomplish something is really subjective, and oftentimes it's not the most important thing. This can be particularly relevant in the area of traumatic brain injuries and the experience that I've had here at work with Richmond, that it may take him extra time to accomplish something, but that extra time often is to ensure that things are accurate, that they're done to his best ability, and that they're done safely. And all of those things are more important than how quickly something is executed. And so keeping that in mind, and also again, giving someone the time and space to do something in a manner that they feel really good about and that they feel safe in. That being said, I'm gonna show you just one of the accommodations that we use here. With Richmond, this is one of his favorite tools. And so I am showing this because this is an example of where instead of someone doing the task for him, we are able to utilize a system and a structure that allows him to do it quickly and confidently himself. And that's a lot of where reasonable accommodations within disability employment come from. It's how can we accomplish <laughs> Keep the standard the same, accomplish the same task, but maybe have a different support or structure in place in order for those things to happen. We've talked before about equality versus exceptionalism, and exceptionalism is when you lower the standard or ask a person with a disability to do less. Equality is where the expectation is still the same. My disabled employees, my non-disabled employees, have the same job duties and responsibilities and the process of how they accomplish those responsibilities may look different based on what each person needs and that's okay but i'm not changing what the standard is or what the requirement is or what the responsibility is but we're open to thinking outside of the box and creating systems or structures or supports in ways that we can and that we need to in order to help someone again where help is needed or wanted so this is the order sheet 
that Richmond uses, which a lot of our servers have notepads and they free hand or script out what people are ordering and then they go and they enter that into the iPad or to our point of sales. For Richmond, the amount of time and strain that it takes to write everything out by hand is is not worth it when you can use something like this, which is, this also helps with memory because the entire menu is written out and it's categorized so that things can be located very easily. The way that this works is that when he goes to the table, instead of writing everything out by hand, he can locate the item and then circle it or make a small note beside it. There's space to put what the table number is at the top of it. There's reminders on here for questions or prompts to ask the table. Again, that helps with the memory aspect so that he's not frustrated feeling like he forgot something and all of the steps of service and the processes are still accomplished. That's one example. And then lastly, in conclusion, wrapping it up, I just want to remind us the importance of our language and our words when we're talking to all humans, but specifically in the the realm or capacity of disability, remembering to the best of your ability what someone's experience is and being kind and respectful with the language and the words that we're using in the process. So for example, not asking a person with a traumatic brain injury, don't you remember? <laughs> or did you forget to? <laughs> or don't you remember that? Because they might have forgotten it. That's part of having a traumatic brain injury and harping on that or doubling down on that is not helpful and can be really Really defeating to someone who is already aware of the fact that they've forgotten something and don't have the control to remember it. Or asking a person who's hard of hearing, did you hear me? Didn't you hear that? <laughs> it's like, no, they probably did it. We can remember that and just, again, provide an alternative question that's more uplifting and valuing of, of who the person is. That's all we've got for this week. Questions, thoughts, comments, drop them below. Thanks, Richmond, for being so faithful to watch these videos. Hope that you feel valued and esteemed through the process of this one. I certainly appreciate you, and we will see you all next week.